Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Horde Steriaman monthly webinar. We are really glad to have you in our audience today. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an editor for Horde Steriaman magazine. I am honored to be hosting this webinar, which will focus on human and animal interactions on dairy farms. We form relationships with the animals we work with, and we care for them, which can be rewarding, but also make certain management decisions challenging. When we think about making improvements in dairy cow and calf welfare on farms, we often focus on reducing the frequency of negative human animal interactions. But it's also important that we are proactive in promoting positive interactions with caretakers. This presentation will focus on the impacts of human animal interactions and what they, um, how they impact both cows and caretakers. And we'll discuss opportunities we can use to engage caretakers in promoting these good experiences. I think this topic really fits well for June Dairy Month as most of us are involved with the dairy industry because we're passionate about dairy cows or we like working with animals. So taking some time to focus on that animal and human interaction seems very appropriate as we celebrate June Dairy Month. Our sponsor for today's webinar is the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council, and we thank that organization for their support of this webinar. If you're listening to the presentation live, you can find a copy of the presentation handouts down in the handout section of that GoToWebinar control panel. Just click on the handout section and there'll be a link there to a PDF, and that is where you can print out or save the slides if you would like to have them for future reference. I'll also point out that there is a question section, and if you have any questions that come up for our speaker, either during the presentation or right after it, please type them into that area of the control panel, and we will answer them following the presentation. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Lily Edwards Calloway. Dr. Edwards Calloway is currently a, an associate professor focusing on livestock behavior and welfare at Colorado State University. Originally from the Northeast, she has a, a Bachelor of Arts degree in French from Amherst College. And then her first exposure to the agricultural industry came during her time at the University of Rhode Island, where she received a master's degree in animal science. After finishing her studies, Dr. Edwards Calloway moved to Colorado, where she received a PhD in livestock behavior under the advisement of Dr. Temple Grandin at Colorado, again, at Colorado State University. Since completion of her graduate work, Dr. Edwards Calloway has held several roles in academia, the packing industry, and cattle production, primarily focusing on improving animal welfare in various management systems, with a specific focus on end-of-life decision-making. She's involved in several industry groups and associations to promote and progress the beef and dairy cattle industries. Dr. Edwards Calloway, welcome to the webinar, and I look forward to hearing your presentation titled Human and Animal Interactions, Impacts on Cows and Caregivers. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come share some thoughts with you today. Uh, I'm very excited that you took the time out of your Monday to do so and listen, um, and hopefully um, I share some things with you that may be just a, a different perspective. I've, I've found lately, you know, especially as Abby, you kind of mentioned in this um, in this space, we all have tons of experience and probably many of you have much more experience than I do actually working hands-on with dairy cattle. And so I think you bring a lot of information to the table on and experience on how human and animal interactions can impact you um, and the cows you care for. And so um, I always kind of think about presentations as just listening to a different perspective of things that you might already have um, quite a bit of knowledge on. So hopefully um, there's some good takeaways from today. So I, when I was kind of going through my presentation and, and looking at what to share, you, if those of you work like me, I have like my Google Chrome open with about 100 different tabs of different papers and pictures and images. Um, and I, I found this, which I thought was quite um, poignant for today's talk um, from you know, our very own W.D. Horde. I noticed to those working with the animals um, a long time ago, talking about when you work with cattle, young and old, and I appreciate the call out to young and old because I think sometimes we forget um, the calves, um, is that of patience and kindness. So, you know, working with animals, being patient, kind, I think those fit right within some of those terms around low stress handling. And the other thing that I think was quite interesting in this was it was it called out kind of the impact on production that rough handling can have. 
Um, and so I thought that was kind of a good note to kind of start off the talk with. So today um, I'm going to talk about, you know, interactions, relationships, and bonds with animals. Um, and I was glad to hear that what I described to Abby is what I think I'm going to give you all today in my presentation. Um, the importance of these human-animal interactions, both positive um, and negative interactions, because I think we all can understand we, we probably have both um, from time to time. And then what can we do to promote some positive change? Uh, and I'll talk through some ideas. But I'm wondering if any of you have access to the chat and are interesting, interested in engaging just that way with a couple of the questions that I ask. Um, my first question to you is, if you could pick one adjective to describe people's or your own relationships with animals, what would it be? So if anyone's bold enough um, to put a word in the chat that might describe your relationship with animals or you know other people's. So I didn't, I couldn't find a word cloud um, that was perfect for this, but I put this up here. So I think, you know, the, the point I wanna make is that our relationships with animals are, are varied, right? Um, it depends on the animal, it depends on our mood, it probably depends a little bit on the animal's moods. Um, it depends on what kind of animal. Um, and this, I found this just as kind of a placeholder for this discussion. Obviously, these are all, I think some of them are very relevant, um, but they're all very positive. Um, and I would argue that sometimes maybe we have some negative emotions um, associated with our relationship with animals as well. Um, and so the point I want to make um, as we get started is that our relationships with animals are varied and dynamic, right? Um, across the board, no matter what kind of animal we're talking about. So I think, you know, the perfect example is companion animals. Um, if we were in a room together, I would ask people who have a companion animal to raise their hand. Um, and I would, I would guess the majority of the room would probably do so. So we find companionship with animals. Um, we have relationships with those that are in our house, in our yard, um, horses. We also have relationships with wild animals. Um, and those probably look pretty different, right, than a companion animal. Sometimes we go on safaris. Um, sometimes it's as simple as having a bird feeder in our backyard or a hummingbird feeder, um, talking about how crazy the squirrels are um, running across the yard. And so I think we have those relationships with animals as well. Uh, and then I put a picture here because this is really the topic that we're gonna focus on the most today, but uh, workers and caretakers and owners and managers um, of any production facility, um, out, dairy included, but beef cattle, pigs, um, poultry, have relationships with animals as well, right? And I think sometimes um, those aren't the first ones we think about, uh, but I bet you it's the first ones that those individuals doing that day-to-day -day care think about. There are some words that oh, came okay. in here. Some of the words that came in are compassionate, um, siblings, caring, um, companionable, constantly learning, uh, gratitude, and then better than working with people. So those are some of the thoughts that people shared. Um, so those are great words. And I think um, I'll capture really the positivity of working with animals. Um, I like compassion. I like caring. Um, better than working with people. I think I could also put on here our relationships with humans are varied and dynamic too, right? Um, so great. That's that's your word cloud for that question. Um, so on the you know on the flip side of the positive, I think sometimes relationships are varied in the sense that they can be challenging. Um, this cat here, I think this is obviously more playful, um, but we probably have some instances with the animals in our home um, that could potentially be frustrating. Um, I think why if we think about wildlife, uh, oftentimes wildlife can have a negative impact on humans and certainly vice versa, right? We'll talk a little bit about relationships um, being reciprocal. And then not wanting to put a, a super negative picture here, um, I think on the we also can have some negative interactions with animals. I think probably all too frequently, we kind of see some of those undercover videos that are negative, um, which are, are infrequent, but I think we do kind of see those. And so relationships with animals are varied and dynamic. Um, and then, you know, just thinking about ourselves as humans, and I think we all can relate to this, um, humans just kind of have an inherent attraction to animals. And I think it's different for people, right? Um, we probably all don't have the same um, kind of inherent attraction, but this kind of idea of biophilia, so this innate attraction to animals, nature, and an instinct um, to connect with other living things is, is a real thing. Um, it starts at a young age. Um, I think we all probably have 
have noticed sometimes when babies are in a room and there's people and animals, the babies often engage with the animals um, even sooner or more frequently. Um, animals can increase social interactions um, when people are in the presence of animals. And I think about this, I, I do have a rescue dog that happens to be a Sharpay, which obviously you don't see very many of those. And so when I take her out, I get a lot of people talking to me, which is maybe not exactly what I, I wanted, but that animal kind of draws people um, together and you kind of have a conversation about it. So there's an evolu evolutionary advantage for us having this connection to animals. Um, and so if we talked about, you know, our relationship with animals being varied and dynamic, I think we can also talk about how human animal interactions are numerous. Um, so pets, again, um, I think just because it's that one that's so kind of glaringly obvious, um, we like having companionship. And so pets, um, this is showing some statistics just looking at households that have a pet. And so just if we look at the top one, over 65 million households in the U.S. Um, have a dog. And so this is showing kind of just by species and people have multiple pets. Um, I myself have multiple pets in my home. And so we have that kind of constant daily interaction with, with animals. Um, and if we don't have them, our neighbors probably do. In a different context, um, we often kind of include animals in some entertainment or, or education. I think entertainment space is changing a little bit, um, but certainly kind of education in zoos. And so, the AZA, um, this acronym on here, is the American Zoo and Aquarium Association. And so they run statistics on the number of annual visitors that they have in their accredited zoos. And so the last statistic reported is 183 million annual visitors. So a lot of people. And across their accredited um, facilities, they have 800,000 different, different animals. And so if we think about all those human interactions, even if they're just visual, which is important, um, they're numerous. And then lastly, again, what we're here to talk about today is human animal interactions um, with dairy cows. And so I think, you know, if we think about the number of people having those interactions, it might be smaller um, than some of the numbers I've shown you. But if we think about the number of animals, um, there's there's quite a few of them. Right. And so it's just a different way to kind of think about these these numerous human animal interactions. And they're certainly just as important. So. Um, I've already used the word interaction, relationship, and bond a couple times. Um, and in this area, you know, human animal studies is a growing area and it's a, a space that looks at um, the spaces that animals occupy in human, social, and cultural wor worlds and the interactions that humans have with them. So it's a kind of a big study area. Um, and all the little, you know, one on one interactions that we have is a human animal interaction. So it's something that occurs between a human and a human and an animal. And so these happen obviously all the time. Um, those are put together to eventually form a relationship or a bond. Um, and so a, relation, a relationship comes after several, several, many, many interactions. Um, there's not really a set timing on when that occurs. I think it's probably highly variable, um, but a relationship is kind of at the point when an animal has expectations of a human um, because they've kind of learned through those interactions. Um, and so those those terms are different. Um, I tried to use them differently in the presentation, but just know when you're kind of digging deep into a human animal study area, um, they might come up, um, you know, used very specifically because they are different things. And so all of these, you know, varied and dynamic and numerous human interactions are important. Um, and I think they're important because they can do good things. Um, they can also be neutral and they're important because they also can potentially cause harm. And so we'll kind of talk through um, what those look like and kind of what we know about those different things um, in the research. So there was a review paper that came out, it's 2014. So um, the data report, it's already about a decade old, um, but this was a review paper. It, they systematically went through all the research, um, you know, using search terms on different um, uh, internet journal databases and abstract databases to look up what papers have been published about human animal interactions, relationships, and bonds. And so a couple take homes from this. Um, the graph shows number of publications um, on the y-axis, and then across the bottom, it shows the kind of different type of context of the paper, so really animal type. And that final um, set of bars on the right-hand side is the total. And so first take home, there's been a growth across animal types in this human-animal interaction um, 
relationship research. So you can kind of see they categorized by years. But if you look at that blue bar at the very end of that graph, um, there's been quite a bit of growth in this space. So we're starting to pay attention um, to this human animal um, area quite a bit more. And then if we look specifically at agricultural animals, um, so overall there were 329 papers. Um, the majority were companion animals and that actually did include horses. Um, and so I thought that was a little interesting uh, combination. It would have been kind of interesting to break that out and see how the numbers looked a little bit differently. Um, and then next was agricultural animals. So less, but still, you know, more significant compared to laboratory or zoo animals. So I think it's a growing area. And if we, you know, redid this um, paper now, it's been a decade. I don't think we would, I don't think agricultural would match companion, but I bet you that we would see a substantial growth in that next bar added to the graph. So as I've mentioned um, a couple times, um, these relationships and bonds between animals um, are, dynamic and they're not unidirectional so they're reciprocal so this definition on here is from the american veterinary medical association i'm um, just kind of sharing what their feeling is about the definition of a human animal bond and so i just put it here because i just want to point out again um, it's mutually beneficial um, and dynamic relationship between people and animals that's influenced by behaviors essential to the health and well-being of both and so I put this here because I'm gonna talk about um, what some of the research has shown around um, these benefits um, between animals and humans. So in that same review paper, um, they went through all those papers to kind of look at um, what was found or what kind of, you know, what kind of, what are studies looking at um, in the human animal study space. And so what they found was that the majority of companion animal papers focused on the benefit to humans. So how are you know, having pets or companion animals in different scenarios beneficial to humans themselves? Um, and I think, I think we're probably very aware of that. Um, some of these are just kind of popular press articles. Some are popular press articles based on scientific studies. Um, but I think if we think about what we see in the media, there's really quite extensive media coverage um, on these benefits. Um, or at least, you know, shared, shared benefits, um, hypothesized benefits. And so I think there's a general belief um, that pets enhance owners' health and sense of, you know, psychological, mental well-being, um, and sometimes even more detailed health benefits than that, which I'll talk about. And so there is science around that. So there is a lot of science, and I put like you know, a couple of references on here, but there's obviously more um, than that, as we even saw in that one review paper had over 300. But um, there are health benefits that have been reported in papers um, that are associated with having companion animals or interacting with companion animals. Sometimes we see it, um, you know, therapy animals being brought into certain environments um, and those kind of patients working with the animals, not just pets in the home. And so there's a, you know, a myriad of things that we found um, in research, reduction in stress, um, some reduction in disease risk, um, reduction in depression, on the flip side, you know, improvements in mood, um, reduction of fear and anxiety. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of kind of, depending on the study, a lot of reasons that people report they might have found these things. I think companionship is a big one, you know, having having the presence of another living being, I think can really help reduce feelings of loneliness and isolation in certain groups of society and certain people. And so I think some of those improvements in mood um, or anxiety or depression, I think that kind of makes sense, right? Um, as I mentioned before, kind of that increase in social interactions. So I think giving people more ability to um, kind of fluidly interact socially um, has a benefit. Um, and then stress reduction, I think sometimes, um, and this is from some of you know the papers, they kind of talk about having um, a companion animal in the presence might buffer or distract um, from some of the other feelings or things associated with you know, the negative state that that study is looking at. Um, so there's a, quite a few studies. Um, and then I just wanna mention here, you know, there is a hormonal component to bonding. So I think we all kind of know about oxytocin um, created in the hypothalamus or in the pituitary released um, during kind of those bonding moments that we think about a lot. We probably hear about more when we think about human, um, like uh, parent and offspring bonding that physical intimacy between um, offspring releases oxytocin. And they've done a lot more studies kind of actually measuring hormone change um, in dogs and, and pet owners um, to look at and see if that kind of those important bonding moments. Here they looked at humans um, 
a deep gaze that's exchanged between dogs and humans. And I, I chuckle a little bit because I have two dogs at home and one is a like a Catahoula cattle dog who has a very intense deep gaze, which actually does not make me feel more bonded. It actually stresses me out. So point being, a lot of these things depend on other factors. Um, one being pet attachment. So my little example, I think pet attachment would probably change how I felt about a deep gaze from a, from a certain pet. Um, so as much as you know, we see the literature that shows all these benefits, um, there is some literature uh, that kind of more questions like this pet effect. So this positive pet effect that we write about, is it fact fiction or hypothesis? Um, and so there's a, you know, a, a good paper kind of talking through this. And I think the take home of that paper was, you know, there's some papers that show effects, benefits. Um, sometimes I think it's not scientific. So that's kind of where the fiction came in. Um, and then they kind of lean towards maybe this is a little more hypothesis. There's more we need to know in this space. And they said a, a variety of different things. Um, so these things are not unique to this area of human animal studies. I think it's probably any area of science, but people measure a wide variety of variables. Um, and you can just kind of see that in the list. Um, they include different um, methodologies in their experimental design. Um, they're looking at different types of outcomes. Sometimes we don't control for confounding variables. Sometimes that's just really challenging, you know, like the attachment that I just mentioned. Um, and oftentimes I think we like to report the more positive results and maybe the ones that are kind of neutral or negative just don't get talked about as much. So I think just caution around um, all these benefits and making sure we're looking at both sides. And I share this, I'm sure we're, I'm sure everybody's sick of um, having a, a pandemic example in a presentation. Um, but I think it's kind of an interesting one. So I'm sure you all knew of people who went and got pets um, during COVID because it helped with that you know, companionship, that loneliness. And there's actually been quite a few studies now that we've had some time um, looking at pet ownership and mental health during COVID. And this was just an example of one. Um, they actually found that um, pet ownership was significantly associated with poorer quality of life just because that extra burden um, during a, a kind of very burdensome uh, trying time. So I think all I want to share here is kind of make sure when you think about these things, there's a whole bunch of um, variables that really make some of this quite complicated. Um, so back to that original review paper that I shared. Um, so we know that they said for companion animals, most of the studies were looking at companion animal benefits to humans. In the agricultural papers, most of the focus was looking at the benefits or harm, um, because I think there's both, right, that humans have on animals. And so um, I think that's just quite a stark difference um, and probably pretty logical when we kind of think about the context, but I thought it was important to mention. And we'll kind of talk through that. Um, before I do that, I wanted to share results kind of related to this um, point. So we did a nationwide um, online, so online survey of undergraduate and graduate students um, in animal science degree programs at uh, land grant institutions across the US. So anyone could take the survey that was given the survey. We sent it to quite a few universities um, and over 400 people took it. And so we asked some questions that were like write-in responses. Um, and the question is written right up here. It was, in your, in your opinion, what does an agricultural a dog or cat or a horse or equid animal need in order to have a good life? And so it was three separate questions. Um, and so we took all those responses that they wrote in, um, reviewed them all and, and categorized them into different themes. And so one theme that came out across all questions was this one on the left-hand side, um, human responsibility and interaction, the mention of the role of the human or the relationship between the animal and the human. And so for the three categories, um, a was agricultural, C was cat or dog, um, and E was horse or equid, or other equid. And then you can see the frequency of mention. So out of, you know, the 400 and something responses, um, this human-animal interaction was mentioned the most for companion animals. The majority of people included that. Um, and then the least for agricultural animals. And so I just, I share this here because I think everyone on this call probably understands how super important it is, these human-animal interactions. I mean, that's like the basis of the care for the animals we have in these, um, in our in our operations. Um, but I think it's not necessarily how all people approach um, thinking about caring for animals. And so I, I just thought that was a kind of interesting thing to share. So um, moving into talking about 
agricultural animals um, or human animal interactions in livestock production. So again, you know, not necessarily different um, to other animal types, but they're numerous um, and they're varied. And so, you know, when we think of an interaction, it can be a direct interaction, us, you know, touching or restraining an animal, but visual uh, contact is also an interaction. Um, and that's a very important interaction that probably we don't kind of, or we take for granted a little bit. Um, there's also auditory um, olfactory interactions and all of those can have an impact. Um, they can be intense, um, intense kind of in time. So there's like intense meaning there's a lot of interactions. Um, it could be intense, meaning some procedures might be more intense in terms of um, you know, duration or how stressful they could be or how painful they might be. Um, and so of all these interactions, some can be good and sometimes they're maybe not as good. And so we're gonna talk through some of that. Um, I share this here because if you're interested in kind of the literature in this space, um, Paul Hemsworth is a name that you probably have come across. Um, he's not the only one certainly that's done research in this space, um, but he's done quite some foundational work on human animal interactions with livestock across species types. And so I just share that because I think if this is something that you're looking, you're interested in looking into more, um, that would be a good name to kind of start your um, search. So in one of his papers, he shares this figure that I think um, helps put into, you know, just some some visualization of, of what we've talked about and what we're going to talk about. Um, so human animal inter interactions can affect an animal's fear response of humans. And so, you know, I think the emphasis of this kind of conversation is we don't want these interactions to cause fear. We at least want them to be neutral. And I think kind of where we're going is we'd like them to be positive. Um, and so if you think about the stock person, um, their attitudes and their behavior, there's quite a bit of literature showing that people's attitudes and behavior um, influence how they behave towards animals. Um, and so if you know it's negative, it can cause fear, um, it can cause stress in that animal, which can have a negative impact on productivity and welfare. And then there's kind of that feedback loop. Um, if a fearful animal might cause more kind of stress um, frustration to the stock person and it's kind of this like you know cycle that keeps feeding on itself so every human animal interaction is important um, because we don't want to cause fear or stress to the animal um, we don't want to reduce productivity or welfare and there's quite a bit of research showing that that we can um, do that if we have negative interactions so there's a lot of research um, across different species you can see i have you know eggs listed on here too so we have seen this in pigs dairy um, poultry reduced um, production in milk or growth rate, pregnancy rate, um, kind of different parameters of productivity. Um, and then it also changes their behavior negatively, which, you know, they're all kind of related. Um, so this is one of those kind of topics in animal welfare, this human animal interaction that I think I like these sometimes, because of course we want to have great interactions with animals because it improves their welfare and it's the right thing to do, but there actually is an economic incentive as well. And so I think it makes it a really easy thing to kind of uh, convince people to do and to talk about because we can see that economic um, impact quite easily. So um, I'm gonna talk through a couple of things just when we're thinking about interaction. Obviously we think about a cow and a person. And so I'm gonna share with you just some things around um, cows' abilities to, to recognize um, different people, different places, and different types of handling. Um, so this was a study that was done just looking at if cows can discriminate between individual people. And so they exposed, it was only nine cows, and a lot of these studies are very low numbers. As you can imagine, it takes quite a bit of training to kind of um, ask the cows these questions in a research setting. So they exposed animals, um, cows, to two different handlers um, that they had no previous experience with. And the handlers were, they were both um, women, they were similar height, wore similar similar clothing. Um, in the paper, they actually also talked about controlling for, for olfactory cues. So they, they didn't make the people use the same kind of hygiene approach, but they asked them to keep their own consistent. Um, so that wasn't a variable. I think that's one that's probably very hard to control. And they varied the order um, of exposure to those individuals. Um, and then they kind of, uh, expose them to them after all these tests and ask the animals to kind of identify um, by doing this trained response, which was kind of um, bumping the handler's fist with their nose. Um, and they could see this difference in response to the one that they were familiar with um, and the one that they were trained to respond to and the one they were not trained to respond to. Um, so you can see here the light colored bars 
were was the handler. Um, those were the responses to the handler that there was no trained response for. And then the kind of shaded bars, that was the response to the handler that they were trained to actually bump their fist um, to get a reward. And so, I mean, you can clearly see here um, that the cows were able to distinguish between people. So the only cue they had was that person um, and they'd learned to respond to them. So can cows, I think building upon that, can cows recognize individual handlers based on previous handling? Um, and again, the answer is yes. And so this was an experiment that was done um, with groups of cows. And so they divided them into a group of cows. Um, they were exposed to one with a gentle handler. So this was someone that provided hay or concentrates, um, let but stroke the animal if the animal allowed it to. Um, and then there was an aversive handling group. And this handler um, actually had to hit the animal on the head every 15 seconds, um, kind of open palm hit. I do, I feel bad for the people that had to do um, these aversive treatments because it comes up in a lot of these experiments. Um, and so if you look at this graph, um, they measured kind of aversion to handlers by a distance score. So the greater the score, the greater um, the distance score, which involved a, a bunch of different behaviors. Um, but you can kind of think about it. They, they distance themselves more from these people. So before treatment, there was no different, um, no difference between the gentle and aversive handler. After three treatments and after six treatments, you can see those bars separate quite a bit. Um, so the cows took, kept a greater distance from the individual who had aversively handled them. So, I mean, it's not rocket science to, to think that, and I'm sure that people on the webinar have experienced that, um, but we actually can see it scientifically, those animals making that choice to stay away from someone um, who handled them aversively. And then this next one I think is pretty interesting. And there's, um, you know, in my search, I probably, I don't think I found all the papers, but there's a little bit less in this area because I think it's a little bit harder to study, um, but kind of asking the question about social learning. So cows, can they recognize other cows receiving treatment from individuals and kind of change their behavior based on that? Um, and so, this study had kind of, um, there's kind of mixed results. Um, this study had, had mixed results in it itself, um, but they did find um, that animals that um, witnessed a cow being treated gently also adjusted their distance um, to that handler accordingly. So if you look at the white bars, that's the demonstrator cow. So a handler was gently um, treating this, this demonstrator cow, and then these observer cows were watching it. And so before treatment, um, there was a difference before treatment as well. But if we look over time, um, the animals kind of learned and they, they kind of changed their distance to the, to the handler over time and kind of were building that relationship. So I think animals certainly social learn. I think in this context, um, it could be confounded by a lot of things. Um, we'll talk a little bit in a couple of slides about the environment they're in. Um, so I think there's a lot more to learn, I guess is my point, but it's, it's pretty interesting. I don't think we always think about our actions um, impacting what animals are watching us. Um, and I think, I think we need to think a little bit more about that. So then this question um, is what I was just referring to, just asking kind of if animals, or sorry, if cows can generalize their fear of aversive handlers to other places. Um, and the study I kind of cite down here, it's a little hard for you to read probably. Um, they did a study and they found that it, yes, sometimes. Um, so it kind of depends a little bit about the animal's environment. So they did again, this study with aversive or gentle handling. Um, the first time they did it, one of the locations of handling was the home pen and another was a treatment stall. Um, the second time they did it, they did two treatment stalls. Um, so away from their home pen. Home pen. Um, and what they found was the animals did respond um, negatively um, to the different types of handling and remembered it when they went into that pen and were uh, exposed to an unfamiliar person um, using only the treatment stall. But when you add that home pen component into there, it kind of changed the results. So I think the take home for that is that I think where things are occurring, if an animal is more comfortable in a certain environment, it might change its behavior to an unfamiliar or kind of previous, you know, negative handler. Whereas if it gets brought to a new place that it's not as familiar with. And so I think that's something that certainly needs to be looked at a little bit more in the research space. So um, human attitudes towards animals will influence their behavior around animals and thus um, that nature of the human animal interaction. So as I had mentioned, there's quite a few studies in this space um, really showing that stock person behavior um, can be related to cow behavior. And in ways that, you know, I think the more the more positive um, interactions and 
less negative behaviors, cows are going to avoid humans less. And people who are agreeable um, actually use more positive interactions and, and less neutral ones. And so I think human behavior is as important, more important sometimes in some of these situations when we're thinking about how animals might respond. So how do we reduce or make better, um, actually make positive, negative human-animal interactions on farms if they exist? Um, and as I mentioned, I think we certainly don't want negative ones. Um, I think neutral ones are are fine, um, but I think if we really want to encourage these positive relationships to be um, developed and these positive interactions, I think it's really important to encourage positive interactions um, and experiences. And so I share this on here because I think this is something that's kind of an overall sentiment in the animal welfare space. So some of you may recognize this as five domains, this kind of figure on the screen. So this has been around since the 80s. Um, David Malore out of Australia uh, kind of put together this framework for assessing animal welfare um, called the five domains. And it's, you know, if you think about the five freedoms, it's kind of rearranged a lot of those, um, shown the importance that all of those physical domains um, funnel into the mental domain, which helps indicate overall welfare status. But the other thing I want to point out in here is this um, call out to positive and negative. So I think just, you know, naturally we have we, we want to reduce negative things. Um, and of course, we want to reduce negative handling events. Um, but I think there's been a push to also promote more positive um, handling events um, and really kind of measure those as well, because we want the animal to have an overall good experience, not a bad one and not a neutral one. And so I think, you know, encouraging these positive human animal interactions kind of fits in the overall um, you know, evolution of, of what we're doing in the welfare space. So what are the mechanisms that can help establish some of these positive perceptions of humans? And I, I put a couple of kind of just keywords on here to talk through. So habituation is something that, you know, if we think about how animals respond to unfamiliar things, usually there's some fear there, right? And so habituation is really the reduction in a fear response resulting from repeated exposure. And so it kind of gets the animal to a neutral space. As I've kind of argued, I think we want to get them past that neutral space to a positive space, um, but we really do want to reduce fear of certain things. Classical conditioning is a type of associative learning. And so what we really want to do is have animals start to associate human presence with something positive. Um, and so I'll give you a few examples in a little bit, but I've mentioned a little bit too, you know, um, you know, gentle stroking, um, calm movement, low stress handling, sometimes reward. There's a lot of different things that could be positive and I think probably we need to be creative in what that looks like. I mentioned social learning. So I think understanding that an animal's learning about how we interact with animals, even if we're not directly interacting with them. And then general generalization. So how are animals, you know, generalizing what they learn about certain interactions, both good and bad um, across to other situations. And so I think the point here is we really need to make every interaction count um, positively. Um, and by increasing these exposures to positive interactions um, and decreasing the occurrence of negative interactions um, for all animals in all locations. So I think, you know, kind of having that in mind. How do we know we've been successful um, in the research space about, you know, promoting positive interactions or looking at the animal's response? And so a lot of it is animal response. So this is another review paper um, that's great, talking about positive um, human-animal interactions. And so if you look here, I know the writing is fairly small, but from a research standpoint, these are the, a lot of the indicators that might be used um, that indicate a positive human-animal relationship, and it kind of shows the direction of change. But a lot of them are about movement or location, um, proximity to a handler. Um, it looks at kind of characteristics of that interaction. It can look at, you know, animals' expressive behaviors, so their body postures, sometimes time around, uh, like latency and duration of interactions. And so there's quite a few ways to do this um, and that are used. And so I just thought that was a kind of interesting thing to share with you all. My question, and I know this could be a very long-winded answer, um, so if you take a little time to chat it, I can always come back to it. Um, but what can we do at the farm level to promote positive experiences for animals? So what kind of thing can we do for the animals that might promote a positive experience? Um, so I'll share one um, while we're seeing if anyone else wants to share. Um, so I think low stress handling is like a, a no brainer one, right? That we probably maybe don't, wouldn't even articulate because it's something that we do all the time. I mean, I know I have a beef picture on here, but um, just kind of demonstrating, I think we host even a lot of industry events that really focus on this, um, the value of low stress handling, and, and that's widely accepted. So I think that's kind of, you know, a foundation to what we already are doing. Um, I put some words on here that I think 
you can kind of see it helps. All those things are related to reducing the fear response of the animal, um, at least bringing them to a neutral zone. And so with continual exposure to low stress, positive interactions, an animal is going to be, um, become less fearful of that interaction. And, you know, it could actually become positive as well. All right, Lily. So we do have some ideas that came in now. Um, okay. First is animal handling training for both new and experienced employees. Mm -hmm. um, kind of kind of similar or along the same lines. Um, start by selecting people who um, have experience working with livestock or positive experience working with livestock. People that, you know, remove people from the team that have negative interactions with animals. Um, allowing people enough time to do chores so that they're not rushed and maybe under stress and reacting negatively. A, a different Kind of a different response here focusing more on the environment um, providing a natural environment as possible quiet um, that allows herd interaction for the cows and maybe reducing stress in that way facility design um, design for ease of movement so i think that fits along with what you were just talking about um, and good lighting so like i said designing maybe some low stress handling facilities mm -hmm. so thank you everybody Perfect. for chiming in yeah thank you that's super helpful and i think yeah it relates like a lot of those relate to low stress handling. So I think one from facilities, um, one from training individuals, um, I heard as well, people who have experience with this already. I think the time comment on time to get things done, we we can't be low stress, right? If we don't have the time to do that. And so I think that's, that's a critical component. Um, our behavior obviously is gonna influence um, the animals. And so I think those were great um, examples. Also, you know, the kind of comments around people, um, I think, you know, being comfortable recognizing that some people might be better at doing different jobs on the on the dairy, but maybe their, you know, interactions with animals, if they can't be changed through training and showing and doing, um, maybe there's a different job that fits them better. And so I think I think those are all great suggestions. Making the interaction rewarding. And this was just a study that I wanted to share um, that they performed kind of with veterinary procedures. And so as I mentioned before, sometimes having positive interactions or relationships with different people on a facility can kind of buffer something that might be more aversive or maybe not preferred or a little bit more stressful for animals. Um, I think there's quite a bit of research in the space um, for shelters. So, you know, you think of a suboptimal environment and humans can really provide social support to those shelter dogs um, in different ways. And I don't think we've like considered that quite as extensively in livestock production. So, you know, if we're doing a veterinary procedure, are there things that we could do ahead of time or during that might help reduce the stress of that animal? This was a study done in dairy cows and they added positive handling for four weeks um, to one group, positive handling for four weeks um, before a veterinary procedure and then the other group just had kind of routine handling it wasn't negative it was just kind of neutral handling with different individuals the treatment group had the same individual doing the positive handling and then they performed rectal palpation um, and did kind of a test scenario where they left the there were a couple different ones they left the animal alone in the in the restraint they left the animal with the handler um, with a different person and so they looked at kind of different scenarios and how the animal responded and generally, um, you know, with some nuances between those different scenarios, the group that had the positive handling for the four weeks prior with that same individual, they had lower heart rate, um, they had kick, they kicked less when they were alone, and they were less restless um, during restraint. And so they, I think they were really able to see if we kind of intentionally add these positive in instances into an animal's life, um, we can maybe provide some buffering to something that we, we have to do, but could be a little bit more stressful. So a different kind of spin on low stress handling. Um, so I just want to mention environmental enrichment opportunity here. So enrichment, I think, if you guys hear of the word enrichment, I think, at least I do, I think of zoos probably first, right? And so this idea that we're adding things into an animal's environment, which is kind of like one of the comments that someone shared, you know, making this kind of natural, um, good environment for the animal that increases, in some cases, physical activity, promotes normal species typical behavior and satisfies some physical and psychological needs. And so we see this a lot in zoos. I showed some examples here of really often around feeding behavior. So having the animal kind of work for food, which is a natural, highly motivated behavior that sometimes is taken away, most times is taken away in zoos, um, has some benefits for those animals. Um, we can think about it in companion animals too. I think probably we, some of you on the call have had those feeder puzzle, puzzles for dogs to make them work a little bit um, to get their food. And so, you know, I guess I, I put the question mark here and this has been talked about in some literature as well, is um, providing kind of these 
positive human animal interactions to animals and um, to livestock production animals an opportunity for enrichment so if we if we think about it um you know there we train animals um, we do procedures with animals um we work with them daily so we have daily interactions and the interactions are part of routines so are there ways that we can kind of change those interactions just slightly um, that can add something a little bit more enriching um, to the environment so just you know thinking about it that way i think is is maybe a little bit different of a mindset um, so i just want to mention um, a little bit uh, so you know I've, i kind of showed you both ways that arrow can go um, there is more interest in looking at how in livestock production so for example you know interactions with cows can actually impact the humans um, there's much less work in that space um, but i think it's growing um, i do a little bit of work in that space and so the compassion that dairy caretakers have towards the animals they care for i think can sometimes it makes their jobs really enjoying enjoyment um, really um, you know rewarding but i think sometimes it can also make their job challenging and so um, you know i've I taught a veterinary animal welfare class, um, which was predominantly companion animal focused individuals. And so I, I had a panel on euthanasia as a welfare topic. And I included people from companion, shelter, um, livestock, some laboratory um, representation, kind of talking about challenges with euthanasia. And I think it really opened eyes to seeing that they're, you know, I think people with companion animals challenged in making euthanasia decisions. And although it's not identical, I think people working with um, livestock also have challenges making euthanasia decisions. And I think sometimes um, people a little bit peripheral to the industry don't understand um, how real those challenges are because of kind of bonds that have been established with animals. And so this is just, you know, most of this work has really, I guess, more focused and not mine only, um, a lot of the work in this space focuses maybe a little bit on more of those decisions that are hard to make. Again, not looking necessarily at the, the positive interactions, um, but we've done, multiple kind of focus groups with dairy caretakers on multiple dairies asking about difficulties around um, euthanasia decision making and again and again and again we what comes up is that animal welfare and empathy to the cows they care for consistently comes up as a theme on some something that makes it really hard despite understanding that euthanasia is a, a really good option um, makes it hard to kind of make those decisions um, i share here just two quotes from some of those focus groups um, that I think um, are really kind of poignant in, in seeing this kind of how these hum these daily human animal interactions kind of lead to these relationships that are formed. Um, so there are cows that are really lovable. You remember the number of the ear tags on that cow. Um, and then there are some cows that are friends and you arrive and they greet you. When they cease to exist, they are missed. And so these are quotes from dairy caretakers um, kind of talking about um, you know, how, why it's difficult to make decisions. And so I think there's a lot more that we need to know um, about this reciprocal kind of relationship with dairy caretakers and cows um, and how we can help them um, enjoy that, but also kind of take some of the challenges out of certain difficult parts of their job. Um, there's still a lot we don't know or that we at least could know more about in the space of human animal interaction. Um, at the bottom, I probably should have put this bullet at the top since I just was talking about this, but what are the human benefits? So I think we have a lot more to know in that space, particularly um, in the dairy industry, but also livestock industry in general. Uh, there's a little bit of work in dairy, a little bit of work in swine, um, and outside of that, I think it's just a little bit more limited. Um, and then just talking about the interactions themselves. So I think I gave you a few examples, but I think we don't really know, like, you know, what's the optimal, best, correct amount of interaction um, in regards to type of interaction, um, frequency of interaction, duration of interaction. I think there's more we could explore there. And I, I think that sometimes people might be trying things already um, that works really great for their operation. Uh, what's the difference between tactile and visual interactions? Um, how, how can that be used um, if we had that knowledge? What are the most rewarding types of human interactions for animals? And then here a little bit, what are the best ways to assess animal response to humans? And I showed you some of the ways that are used. What can we do at the farm level to promote positive relationships between caretakers and animals? So just like slight nuance on the question, but I think I'll go through what I have. And then if at the end there's a question that relates to that or a share, someone, if someone just wants to share. So thinking more from the standpoint of what can we do to help the people um, really want to promote these positive interactions between caretakers? And I just put a handful of these together in no particular order. And this is, you know, Lily thinking what 
could be helpful. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of other things to add to the list. Um, so I think explaining the why. And so this has come up in you know a variety of different venues. Um, I think it's really important to explain the why to people. You know, we mentioned um, someone in the chat mentioned animal training for new and you know experienced people, and I think we need to tell them why those things are important. So why is a positive interaction with a human important to the animal? Um, and I think that helps people understand like the relevancy of their job task. And I think honestly feel motivated to do the job well, right? Um, if I don't understand why I was doing something, I wouldn't be particularly motivated to do it necessarily. Um, show by doing. So I think it's great to, to tell people what to do, but I think we've also got to walk the walk and really show by doing. So promote those positive interactions when we're working with the animals or visiting dairies or however, you know, whatever our role is in, in the dairy space. Listen to both successes and challenges. So I think we need to, I have communicate on here, I think next is communicate, but I think we really need to have open um, conversations about, you know, I had a, a great interaction with animals today. They moved better or they responded great or whatever that story might look like and also listen to the challenges and so I think as I mentioned at the very beginning sometimes working with animals is not easy and not enjoyable and so I think listening to those frustrating times can probably help um, can probably help flip those maybe more frustrating occurrences into something a little bit more positive so I think listening to both and giving support for both is important um, communicate that's kind of general and I mentioned that um, follow up and share outcomes. So I think this is one of those things that because there's um, sometimes a, a clear response in animal behavior or productivity, it's really hopefully a little bit more easy to kind of show what the outcome of a good interaction or good interactions over time might do. So, you know, there's been several studies that have kind of looked at, um, I've mentioned a few, but there was one in sows, for example, that's a little more recent, and they did five seconds of back scratching sows for a week prior to farrowing um, and found that they re could reduce piglet mortality. Um, there were a couple you know confounding factors in that study but but point being if you can show an individual whose job was to do that or whose job is in you know farrowing and show that they're actually making a reduction or a, sorry an improvement in their productivity outcome I think that's a great thing um, to show success um, to something that you're trying and then engaging your um, support team so I think whether this is a veterinarian or nutritionist we see again and again um, in some of the work we've done talking to veterinarians that they want to engage more in kind of the training space. And so I think um, human animal interaction is a great way to do that. Um, and so I think engaging that support team is, is a beneficial way to try. Um, so my last thing I just wanted to share, this was from the paper that kind of was talking a little bit, the uh, kind of pet effect paper. So it was more on companion animals, but just to kind of end, the study of our interactions with animals is interesting, important, and challenging. So I think we all can appreciate that. And then the other bolded component here is that animals play a role in nearly every aspect of human psychological and cultural life. And so agriculture is one of those. And so I think um, there's a, a huge opportunity to understand more in this space and make some really positive improvements for both um, the humans and the animals. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Lily, for that presentation. And I think kind of opening our minds to a different um, thought or different area of study in regard to dairy cattle and, and how they interact with people. So thank you for sharing that. I would also like to thank the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council. I'm an organization that very much um, emphasizes good interactions with animals and good facilities that really encourage um, good welfare of cattle. So if you're interested in their organization, feel free to look them up online. And they're always welcoming new members from the industry to participate in their annual symposium and be a member of the council. Before we move on to questions, I just wanna point out that we have some upcoming webinars. In July, our focus will be vitamins and we'll have Dr. Bill Weiss from the Ohio State University coming to talk to us about dairy cattle rations and the importance of vitamins in those. And then in August, we'll be gearing up for corn silage harvest with a discussion led by John Gazer from Rock River Laboratory and JPG Nutrition Consulting. So please mark your calendar and make plans to attend those future webinars. Today's program and all of our webinars can be found on our Hordes website. So you just look up hordes.com. There's a webinars tab and there we have all of our archive presentations from um, many years worth of great speakers like Dr. Edwards Calloway and all of their presentations that are archived there. So please check that out if you're interested. Now we had some questions that came in. So I will go through these. It's quite a bit of variety. Have any studies been done on how much human vocabulary um, dairy cows can recognize? So this person's saying they, you know, they notice that their animals seem to understand um, vocabulary related to their names or maybe 
feed or milking routines. Do you have any, I don't know, any experience yeah. or thoughts on that? Um, that's a great question um, and super interesting. I have not come across one that doesn't mean it doesn't exist um, in terms of vocabulary. I think there's there's been some looking at kind of just audio, um, listening to people speak gently um, or music or, you know, loud yelling from a rough handling standpoint, but vocabulary I haven't noticed. That would be pretty interesting. And I, I bet you would be pretty dairy specific, um, but definitely something to look into. Great. And here, kind of a similar question. Wonder if there's been any work done on the olfa olfactory senses and the application that different odors might have in either calming or kind of making cattle more nervous. Yeah, that's a great, another great question. I think olfactory to me is one of the things that we probably don't look at enough at all because if we think about like us in the animal's environment, um, I think obviously visual, auditory, we might see see and think, hear things a little bit differently, but we at least like can cue into those. I think olfaction is just something. We don't use that sense as much and i think we kind of you know we smell and we get overwhelmed by just a constant kind of smell so i think whereas there's probably been a little bit of work um, maybe not exactly in the human animal interaction context um, it's probably an area that would warrant from quite a bit of um, of growth um, and understanding so i think that's kind of an untapped um, area i will say just outside of this context in, in looking at olfaction i did a little work on kind of animal senses cows and particular and there is just limited work in that space in general um, from like olfactory again because I think I don't know cows like haven't been the sexiest type of animals to study from olfaction I mean like dogs and rats they kind of get the most focus so definitely a, a, a untapped area we received a comment that I will paraphrase but I think it has an important message here it's someone from the UK who has studied public perception um, in regard to human and animal interactions. And they said people in general really do value that. And there may be some negative um, or some concerns about the use of technology, which distances people from mm -hmm. animals. And um, just kind of a reminder that it's it's not necessarily a bad thing to show that attachment to animals because the public the public does perceive that as a positive. So Yeah, I think that's a great comment. Um, I think um, even just looking at the picture that we have on the screen, right? I mean, how that makes us all feel good um, seeing that interaction. And I think that's like one of the, you know, value attributes, I think, of dairy and other production industries is this people caring for animals um, and keeping them healthy and safe. And so I totally agree with that. And I do think um, as we kind of get more technologies, we take away some of that. Um, and so I think it's important to make sure when we, when we do that, we remain, we keep some intact and really prioritize making those really positive. So I think that's a great point. And there actually has been um, some papers kind of talking about as the industry shifts, I um, mean, the world shifts and we have more ability to use technology. How do we adapt um, to that in the context of human animal interaction? This is a little more of an animal husbandry question, but I'll throw it out there. Um, what is your recommendation for group size when animal handling? Um, just maybe some comments of handling animals individually versus trying to keep them in groups. Yeah, so I think um, group size obviously can be pretty variable, and I think it depends a little bit on the type of handling and handling facility. I think generally animals um, don't always love being by themselves. And so I think oftentimes their response, if they're alone, is going to be a little different than in a group. I probably, we could argue that some animals don't mind either, right? And I think with dairy cows, there's a clear routine. Other types of animals maybe don't have that same one-on-one um, -on -one contact as often. And so I think it's probably a little bit different in that scenario. But I mean, if, if you can tell an animal is agitated being alone, adding one to the mix or even adding just, you know, one animal um, is really helpful. And then, you know, most of my experience with group size would be a little bit of a different context than a dairy, more at a slaughter plant. And so I think um, oftentimes, moving smaller groups we actually you know go faster because the animals move better than when we overcrowd those systems um, and don't give the animals enough space to really understand where they're even supposed to go so I think group size too big is not great um, and you can be more efficient at a smaller size and then I think just because the word individual is kind of thrown into that question um, I think you can really watch the animal to kind of see how they respond about um, to being by themselves or, or with another. Um, going back to the beginning of the presentation, could you review the difference between the term bond and relationship? Yeah, um, and that's a that's a good one. Um, that's a good question. I think, and I don't know that I can tell you the exact definition dis exact definition difference. I think. I, and maybe in our context, would use them interchangeably. I think when you get pretty deep down into the human-animal studies, bond just becomes something 
a little bit stronger more over time. Bond is definitely positive, whereas I think relationship could be either way. Um, so that might be one way to kind of to think about it. I guess in the context of my presentation, I, I think that if an animal has too many negative interactions, a relationship's not necessarily formed to the same extent. Um, but when an animal, if you hit a relationship and an animal starts to expect something from a human, it could also expect something negative. So I think bond becomes more positive, longer, um, more like attachment, um, where relationship is kind of that, I guess, over time expectation based on human animal interactions that preceded that. The next question is how much does noise affect cows and going along with that, does playing a radio in the background make a difference? Um, in general, cattle seem to like quiet, but they can get used to background music playing. Uh, any thoughts yeah. There? So sound, I think auditory is a is another great kind of sense um, that, that cows use and I think can certainly impact them. I think we've seen, um, there's been some work looking at uh, really kind of loud, aggressive yelling um, can increase heart rate and things like that during handling. Um, on the kind of context of what you're asking, there have been some studies that, actually the one I mentioned was confounded by a radio. So they had um, kind of gentle stroking of animals, but they also also had the radio on. And so it was hard to know if it was actually the music or if it was actually the person um, doing the stroking. And so I think, I think there could be something there. Looking at positivity of providing kind of that background noise, I have zero idea what kind of music you might play, but I think there's a little bit of work in that space. But again, you know, if, if that's something that you've tried and you see the difference in your animals, then, you know, maybe it's, it's something to share and, and see if someone can kind of test that out from an experimental standpoint. Um, a lot of the tricky thing with some of these studies is controlling all the other variables. And so I think we can control kind of interaction, like direct physical tactile interaction with animals a little bit more, but those auditory cues and the olfactory cues, I think are a little bit more challenging. So I think there's potential in that space for sure. Very good. Um, if anyone out there is looking for a copy of the handouts, you can go to the handout section of the control panel, and then you'll see a link to a PDF. So if you want to grab that before we close the webinar down, um, please do so at this time. Um, Dr. Edwards Calloway, I would like to thank you for addressing that group of questions and of course for the presentation that you shared today. Um, I'd also like to extend a thank you to the Dairy Cattle Welfare Council for supporting this program and I also want to thank my teammate Patty Hurchin who works on the production side of the webinars. Last but not least, I want to thank all of you in the audience, whether you're a dairy producer or you're working with people on dairy farms, really hope that you found today's program valuable. And I also want to wish you a happy June Dairy Month. Um, it's a great time for us to celebrate all of you that are working so hard day in and day out to take care of the dairy cows that help us all feed the world. So until next time, I want to say goodbye to you all from our team here at Hortz Dairyman, and we hope that we'll see you on a future webinar. Take care.